Darkness is not an affirmative force. It simply reoccupies the space vacated by the light. This is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. It should be uncomfortable for a believer to live as a hypocrite. Delivering people out of the bondage of mainstream media. And the philosophies of this world. God has called you and me to be his ambassadors. Even in this dark moment. Let's not miss our moment. And now, the Hamilton Corner. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. I am your host, Abraham Hamilton III, and I am grateful that you have made the decision, made the decision to tune into today's program. Um, This is the day that the Lord has made, and I will certainly rejoice and be glad in it. There are lots of things that are happening um, all over the world, all over our country, but it's vitally important that that we refuse to allow the things that are happening on really on the international stage, on a national stage to move us away from our perch of faithfulness in serving the Lord and serving the King of glory. He is worthy of us living lifestyles of worship. We enjoy, I enjoy uh, singing worship unto the Lord. I enjoy uh, studying his word. I enjoy communing uh, with his saints. Uh, But the reality is that worship is not merely an activity. Worship is a lifestyle, brothers and sisters. Worship is a lifestyle. And it is a lifestyle that is typified. The pinnacle, the zenith of worship is obedience. What is our singing worth? What is our Bible study worth? What is our gathering with the Lord's saints worth if we don't put into practice what he teaches us? If we don't implement what he says us, says to us, what if we don't obey what he calls us to? Worship is a lifestyle, and it is typified by obedience. At this very moment, many of you, if not most of you, are making the transition from your part-time jobs where you generate an income to your full-time jobs where you cultivate an outcome. Outcome cultivation, brothers and sisters, is the overflow, the downstream imminent consequence of being captured by the king of glory. To say it differently, it is impossible for you to be transformed and to remain fruitless. The fruit production that our Lord desires is first internal, that we are transformed to be like him on the inside, to where our character is transformed, to where our integrity uh, emanates from our being, not because we're trying to prove something or to perform anything, but because it is who we are. It is who we are. We love the truth. And as a result, we live the truth. And loving the truth and living the truth causes us to live in such a way to where we can't abide a lie. Lies that are expressed, lies that are communicated by omission, or lies that are lived. Which is why hypocrisy is um, seethingly uncomfortable for a believer. And the Lord knows that we are in various stages of growth and development to where we're endeavoring to live up to uh, our regeneration. But make no mistake about it, uh, hypocrisy is uncomfortable for a believer. We cannot persist in living in this this, this duplicitous false, fa- false face uh, paradigm. So as outcome cultivation, because outcome cultivation is the inevitable consequence of being born again, if, if he is the vine and we are the branches, and we abide in the vine, fruit production is the evident and inevitable consequence of that reality. And it's not easy for us who have been born again to go in and out of our daily lives, into our jobs or our businesses or in our our homes with no concern of eternity. But we recognize that in light and in full view of eternity, we have the privilege of living on this side in the here and now. And so, Outcome cultivation is our investment because this is what our king has called us to. That commitment to outcome cultivation starts right in our own homes. As a result of being joined to me, my wife should be better, should be more committed to the Lord, should be greater served, greater resolved, greater advanced in her sanctification journey because she's connected to me. The same is true because I'm connected to my wife, that our relationship with one another boosts and boons Our sanctification, our commitment to God and to one another will result 
and our also and us also being committed to rearing his heritage in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The Paideia and Nuthasia of the Lord. We're going to get into that, Lord willing, later into this program. The world is working feverishly to capture the heart, to capture the heart and minds of your children. Make no mistake about it. What are we going to do about that? I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of the of the, the enemy, Satan, making inroads into the Lord's church and carrying off our children as spoils of this spiritual war that we're in. To where, where we have increasing generations of church familiar people who become adults who live outwardly as rebels. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. And it's happened by and large on the watch of the professing church through a combination of affirmative investment and negligence. It's high time for the buck to stop with us. To the word of God we go. Ephesians chapter 6. I referred to this already. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. The word of God says this. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, with the promise, so that it may be, so that it may be well with you. And that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The discipline and instruction of the Lord. I've explained this before, but I'm going to do it again. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, that is to the church at Ephesus, consists of six chapters. But the chapter and verse demarcations are not included in the original Greek manuscripts. All right. The bulk of the New Testament is written in Greek, Koine Greek, to be specific, which is the conversational Greek of the first century. All right. The first half of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, Paul's epistle to the Ephesians is written in the indicative mood. It is indicating who we are now that we are in Christ Jesus. It is there where Paul writes these glowingly uh, transcendent theological maxims. For you were once dead, for you were dead in trespasses and sins. But you've been quickened alive together in Christ Jesus. That's indicating who we are now that we've been purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. The second half of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians is written in the imperative mood. Chapters 1 through 3 through in the indicative mood. Chapters 4 through 6 is written in the imperative mood. These are commands, imperatives that flow from who we are now that we are in Christ. Because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus now, the second half of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians instructs how then we are to live. These are commands, brothers and sisters. Do we understand that? When the word of God says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Do we realize this is not a suggestion? This is the eternal king of glory, the sultan of time and eternity, the one who commands the angelic hosts, who says, fathers, this is your duty. This is your job. I command you this day to rear my heritage in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Too many of us treat this and other commands in Scripture as if they are merely suggestions. This is a command to my military personnel, my veterans who are listening. This is an instruction from the commanding officer. I've explained before for the phrase, rear, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The term discipline comes from the Greek word paideia. Paideia. Paideia means the whole training of the mind and the morals. The whole training. The whole training of the mind and the morals. This idea that faith is to be conveyed as estranged from the cultivation of the mind. This bifurcation of academic matriculation from spiritual development is not a biblical bifurcation. In fact, it's unbiblical to sever the cultivation of the mind from spiritual growth and development. 
I've said before and I'll say it again. When we do that, because God has made man in his likeness and in, in, in his image, human beings have the capacity that God has hardwired in us to put a fine point on it. Human beings have the wherewithal to construct when we are estranged from the covenant of God and his instruction and his purpose, purposes and his commands, human beings will, will build towers of Babel. To have people, bearers of God's image, who are offered a system of discipleship and instruction that cultivates the mind, but remedies that, that renders them foreign and estranged from the instruction of the Lord, we are literally creating weapons of mass destruction. The phrase, the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Instruction comes from the Greek word nuthesia, nuthesia, which means calling one's attention to. Fathers, the Lord commands you and me to summon our, our children's attention, to summon their attention to the Lord's ways. This is a command. Now, I want to be very clear. This is what God requires of us as fathers. I've said before, it is God himself who introduced the concept of fatherhood and motherhood, by the way, into the human experience. When the Lord created Adam and Eve, no biological parents, no biological ancestors, yet of them, the Lord says, for this reason shall a man, back to Genesis 2, leave his father. When God introduced the idea of fatherhood into the human experience, he had something very specific in mind. That, specif that sp specified intention, in intention includes fathers being primarily responsible for ensuring the paideia and nuthesia of the Lord are transmuted to subsequent generation of generations of image bearers. This is why he's blessed us to become fathers. Now, the scripture allows for us to call others to aid us in this process. We can we can add we can involve involve others to help us in this process. But make no mistake about it. The process is what the Lord requires of you and me. Among the things that when we stand before we who are believers, the judgment seat of Christ, among the things that the Lord will query us about. And hold us accountable for is what have we done with his heritage? It's high time for us as fathers to no longer put the spiritual formation of our children on the back burner or to cede that ground to someone else as if they are responsible for it taking place. No, we are the ones who are responsible for this transpiring. And as I'm saying this, this is why you see so often why there's such warfare to keep uh, men uh, consumed and busied and focused and diverted in attention in all kind of other ways. And where sometimes we just, you know, we just stand back and we just expect our wives to do it. We hope they'll do it or we hope somebody else will do it. Which sounds very similar to what happened in the very beginning. When the Lord gave Adam the command concerning the tree in the middle of the Garden of, e of, of Eden. And then they ate Eve and then Adam. And when God came, Adam, where are you? Remember this. God never asks a question because he doesn't know the answer. <laughs> Whenever God asks a question, he's driving at something deeper in the one to whom the question is proposed. God did not become you know, inconveniently ignorant as to Adam's geolocation. Adam, where are you? No, there's been a breach. There's been a fissure in our intimacy. What was Adam's response? Ultimately, or this woman you gave me. Brothers, it is our jobs as fathers. We are responsible for the quality with which we invest the Lord's heritage, which, would, which is our children, and being reared in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, the discipline and instruction of the Lord, the paideia and nuthesia of the Lord. This is our responsibility. Today is the day for us to step into that role if we have not done so to date. And if we have, by God's grace, let's press in even the more. 
because make no mistake about it, this is a command of God for which we will be held accountable. What temptations fight for the throne of your heart? Money, relationships, food, security? If any of these things are the source of your daily motivation, you may feel drained and spiritually exhausted. Maybe this is all you know. Maybe fighting for control is your normal. It doesn't have to be. Try asking God what it means to rest in Jesus. Spend time thinking about Him, Jesus, God in the flesh, desires relationship with us so much so that He died on a cross to take the punishment that we deserved. There is rest in Jesus, and that rest comes from seeing how much Jesus loves His people and responding to His love with everything we are given. So go, ask Jesus to help your unbelief. Look to God through Scripture, then look to God through His faithful followers, and experience the rest of worshiping God with all your heart. This has been an encouraging word from American Family Radio. Snickers is running an unnecessarily vulgar commercial that makes light of sin and swinging. The commercial features two couples playing a board game where a misunderstanding leads to one person expressing interest in wife swapping. It's poor taste to make light of such an indecent topic, especially when aired on family-friendly television. Join us at One Million Moms to get Snickers to stop its inappropriate marketing campaigns. Sign the petition at OneMillionMoms.com. That's OneMillionMoms.com. Romans 12 says, Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Ministry is holy, it's an honor, and it's hard. We don't all have to be best friends, but I will never understand or get behind wives and mothers in ministry tearing down another woman. Why do we make her wins about our losses? If you're gossiping today, go ask for forgiveness. If you're wounded, do good and let God handle the rest. Read the rest of Mean Girls and Ministry by Lauren Bragg at thestand.net. Shining light into the darkness, this is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner. Abraham Hamilton III here. I am honored and privileged to have in studio with me Mrs. Chelsea Wildman, Associate Director of the AFA Foundation. Chelsea is the wife of AFA Vice President Wesley Wildman, and they've been married, no, no. Not married. How long have you been Well, we have, we're actually going to celebrate next week um, 10 years. Crap. Congratulations. Yes, thank 10 you. years. 10 years. Praise God. And you all yes. have three children. We do. Yes. You have three children. And one of the things you love the most about working in the foundation, we're going to get into that a little bit to explain to the listeners and the viewers, viewers what, what the FF Foundation is, is that you enjoy hearing how God has worked in their lives. Absolutely. Yes. We get to know um, our supporters. Um, pretty well. And we work with them closely to set up charitable gift annuities, um, mm-hmm. et cetera, which we'll talk about. But yes, we we get to see how AFA and AFR have impacted their lives. Um, of course, you know, God working through us uh, to reach them. And that's one of my favorite parts of my mm-hmm. job. Praise God. Now, since you've mentioned it, and we're going to talk about it anyway, would you explain to the viewers and listeners, what the AFA Foundation is. Yes. So we are the financial stewardship branch of the American Family Association. We um, mainly seek to um, put in in place charitable gift annuities Mm -hmm. for our supporters. So that gives folks a lifetime income Mm -hmm. during their retirement years. And Mm -hmm. then they are able to leave a legacy and give back to um, AFA and AFR after they pass. Mm -hmm. Um, So once, you know, they get to to heaven, they have left a legacy that lasts for many years to come Mm -hmm. for the work of the American Family Association. And And they get some great benefits from that as well, um, tax-wise. Yeah, I mean, yeah, share that. What are yes. what are some of the the benefits that you're aware of? Now, let me just say this: we're not offering tax advice over the airways. Yes, and, you know, you guys need to seek your uh, prof- tax professionals, finance professionals, where you are. But we're just sharing generally what the AFA Foundation is and what's available to you should you uh, choose to uh, pursue that course of supporting the work of AFA. Yes, absolutely. So we do like to tell folks up front, just like you said, um, we are not financial advisors. Um, We do have a wonderful financial advisor for our foundation, Mm -hmm. um, and he does give us wonderful guidance as well as our financial um, 
board of Mm -hmm. AFA and AFR. But yes, so we specialize in charitable gift annuities. That is giving folks a lifetime income for the rest of their life. Um, Mm -hmm. They can put one person on that or they can have two listed. So it's great. Um, No, actually the beneficiary is the American Family Association. So if you and your wife, Maria, Mm -hmm. were to want to put one in place. As annuitants. uh, Yes. As together. Yes, Yes, absolutely. And then Um, you get a partial tax deduction the year that you put the gift in place, as well as partial tax-free income when you start to receive those payments. So not only are you helping AFA and AFR um, after you pass to leave that legacy behind Mm -hmm. um, for the work of the ministry, but you also do get those tax benefits. So to to be clear, and some people who are listening, you're familiar with the concept of an annuity generally. And so annuities exist to allow you to make an investment of a certain amount of money and then you get a return of the exact same amount of money for the remainder of your life. Absolutely, yes. It's a fixed percent. So that percentage is based on your age, so your date of birth, and when you choose to receive the income. You can mm-hmm. receive it immediately um, if, if need be, or any amount of time that you wait to and you defer that payment, then it will be a higher percentage for you. That you, you. receive in monthly payments. Exactly, yes. And once you get that, the annuitants getting their monthly payments, does it remain the same for the duration of the lifetime? It does, yes. So we have a an immediate gift annuity, so receiving the income immediately, you know that percentage up front. We have a deferred gift annuity to where you can put it in place for a certain time, say mm-hmm. 2025 or mm-hmm. 2026, you mm-hmm. pick a specific date. And then a flexible deferred gift annuity. So that gives you a span between five and 10 years to say, I don't know when I'm going to need that income mm-hmm. for retirement retirement. But between these years, I think it will be, you know, one of these years. So Mm -hmm. then, yes, they will know those percentages up front. And then they simply let us know when they want to trigger those payments and they would um, begin then. Mm. And so uh, deviating somewhat from the traditional annuity, the charitable gift annuity would allow you um, to really include AFA in your um, estate planning. Exactly. To where upon your promotion to glory, yes. <laughs> uh, the corpus of your annuity investment would be a charitable gift to AFA. Exactly. Yes. So that is a wonderful way where you can support uh, the work of the American Family Association because we're people, by God's grace, who uh, are monthly givers. We have those who may be one-time givers. Uh, there are some who quite a few people actually who take advantage of this charitable gift annuity option, which has both the benefit of a consistent stable income during your lifetime. And at the same time, upon your promotion to glory, you'll be able to make a donation uh, through the resources of who our Lord has trusted into your care during your lifetime to FA. That's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful program. Yes. Yes. We enjoy working with our supporters. I work alongside of um, actually my sister-in-law, Riley Wildman um, in the foundation. She is our director. And yes, her and I, um, we enjoy speaking to our supporters daily and seeing if this is a right fit for them, because it might not be the correct fit for everyone, but for those that it is, it's a wonderful piece of your retirement portfolio, a piece Mm -hmm. of the pie. Mm -hmm. Yes. For later years. So how can viewers and listeners uh, learn more information or just get in contact with the AFA foundation? Yes. We would love moving them in this direction. Yes. We would love to speak with them. Um, They can visit afafoundation.net. That is our website. So again, afafoundation.net, or they can give us a call 1-800-326-4543. Extension 345. Okay, so that is the way you can get in contact with the AFA Foundation. And I I would definitely uh, recommend for you to consider that. Pray about uh, whether or not the Lord will move you to add this to your uh, estate planning and even even your investment portfolio because you do have the opportunity to have a a static income for your lifetime depending on when you determine you'd want to draw that income. And so that is an option that is available to you, a, a very, very good option that some people really uh, prefer in an environment where you have kind of instability amongst the stock market, instability in certain areas. This is something that will provide a stable revenue source uh, for you. So it, it's a good option that's available to you. Yes, absolutely. Now, there is something else coming up that will take place in April of 2024, yes. uh, the AFA Retreat. 
Would you share with the viewers and listeners a little bit about that? Absolutely. So our AFA retreat, um, I, Riley and myself get the pleasure of planning this every year, and we always look forward to this time for our supporters to meet, gather, take a break from the everyday hustle and bustle of life, and get to meet with our um, staff and our speakers. So it's a... um, We will be meeting April the 3rd through the 6th of 2024. It's at Purcell Farms in Sylacauga, Alabama. It's a beautiful location, very serene, peaceful. Um, You're really tucked away into the beautiful, I guess, hills, countryside, what, what have you, of Alabama, and you are able to just you know, dig into God's word, hear some amazing speakers, um, really get to worship um, with our wonderful worship leaders, Tom and Linda Wilson, and hear what we're doing at AFA and AFR um, to, you know, continue to promote um, God's word in our culture and just a time to uplift and encourage and really retreat away, Mm -hmm. which we are called to do. So. Is this something that's available to, to all su- supporters to, to participate in? And if so, how can can they be involved in the, and attend the AFA retreat? Yes, absolutely. So we have opened this up to all of our um, supporters for AFA and AFR. Yes, you can visit afaretreat.net to get more information. Um, that will have a detailed schedule. It lists our, our wonderful speakers, shows some of the accommodations and um, information about the retreats. So again, that's afaretreat.net, or you can give us a call, and I would love to speak with you about the different rooming options that they have and um, kind of dig into those details. And we can be reached at, again, 1-800-326-4543, extension 345. Is the invitation that's made available to everyone is there a cap to the number of people who will be able to attend? Yes. So we are limited to 125 registrants. Okay. Um, so those attendees, we like to keep it. They, we we could have more, but we like to keep that smaller so that we really get that, um, you know, one-on-one meeting time and getting to visit with other supporters um, around the country. We've had um, folks from Wyoming, California. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, North Carolina. I mean, People really travel from all over the country, and we have a few ladies that have actually, and these are the neat stories that I I like to kind of retell, four ladies have actually, I believe it was about three years ago, they decided to room together in a cottage, and now they make it an every year trip, and Mm. it's so wonderful to see that they came from different states, different walks of life, you know, different areas, but have AFA and AFR in common, and then they built these friendships Mm. that have really lasted for years, and they keep in touch, so it's really neat to see that as well. What are the the dates again for the retreat? Yes, April 3rd through the 6th of 2024. Mm. And you go to AFA Retreat. Dot net. Yes. Okay. For more information. Uh, for more information. Is there anything we're leaving out that you want to make sure we tackle? Well, I think that that is, I think we've covered most everything. Um, a list of the wonderful speakers are listed on our website. Um, a few of those, Ray Pritchard, Jenna Ellis, Bishop E.W. Jackson, Rob West. And we will also have a um, president, vice president panel um, while we are there with um, Wesley, Walker, Ed, Stacy, Tony, um, Tim to go over the work of AFA and AFR. And we can um, answer any questions that our supporters might have about the ministry. It'll be a great, great opportunity um, for you to get some direct contact time with a lot of the principals here at AFA. I've been a part of the retreat in years past. I won't be a part of this one, I don't believe, unless somebody's <laughs> scheduled me and I don't know about it. Uh, uh, but this will be in April of 2024. Uh, I'd encourage you to go to afaretreat.net now if you're intending to go because those 125 seats are going to fill up really quickly. Absolutely. And actually about half-half. So um, just want to, you know, create some urgency. If you are wanting to attend, we do, um, yes, encourage you to mm-hmm. visit and, you know, register as soon as possible. All right. AFR, AFR, AFAretreat.net is the website. Chelsea Wildman, thank you so much thank for joining you. me here. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. Guys, I definitely encourage you to go and get that on. I encourage you to go go and, and, and get that uh, registration in immediately because 
She said about half have already filled up, you know. So uh, you got about, what, 60-some-odd seats that are, that are or, or 60-some-odd spaces that are still available, that are still available um, for you to take advantage of. And so <laughs> it would probably be good if you get that any sooner rather than later. And also I, I do want to reiterate uh, the things that are available to you through the AFA Foundation. Check out uh, the AFA Foundation's website. Uh, great resources that are available for you there as well. All right. And it's just interesting uh, that we we are able to have this conversation uh, following the discussion we've had before about uh, the responsibility of fathers to invest in sons. And so I, I, I do uh, want to expand a bit further on that. I want to turn our attention to Psalm 127. And I know I've talked about this before. And, and then I'm going to read the entire psalm, uh, but I want to unpack it just a little bit. And I, I know I'm going to carry this over into the next segment. Uh, but specifically, the, the last two to three verses in the psalm, Psalm 127 only has five verses in it. It's a psalm of ascent uh, written by Solomon. And it says this, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the watchman guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labor. So some translations there say anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord or the heritage of the Lord, some translations say. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. Hmm. It's instructive to note that the Lord describes children as his heritage or the gift of the Lord and the fruit of the womb as a reward. Our society treats the fruit of, a womb, of the womb as a punishment, as an impediment to living a good life, you know, as a, as a drag on Maslow's hierarchy of self-actualization, you know. But the Lord says the fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows. So the Lord isn't saying that they are physically arrows. He's using uh, a simile, saying that they are like arrows. Children are like arrows in the hand of a warrior. How blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them, whose quiver is full of them. It's interesting to note that the, the scripture begins in verse 4 with the simile of children being like arrows in the hand of a warrior. But the individual warrior is joined in an expanded battalion by the time we reach the end of the psalm. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Verse 5, they will not be put to shame. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gates. The Lord desires for the arrows to grow into becoming fellow warriors. The Lord also reveals that the investment of trust that enables the arrow to become a fellow warrior is to be placed in the quiver, the tutelage, the protection, the nurture of a warrior. Arrows become fellow warriors as a result of being deposited and invested with a skillful warrior. Not one that is hoping to be a warrior. Not one who maybe one day might get to, this, to the task of becoming a warrior, but who is a warrior. That speaks to one who's already on the front lines. We'll get into this a bit more on the other side of the spring. My wife, Jan, played in the marching band in high school and then in college. They all had matching uniforms, but when they played the music, nobody played exactly the same thing. As believers, unity of the faith, we're not the same. Uh, we're different. We have different parts to play. Mm. But there can be unity as we play our part in Christ Jesus. Exploring the Word, weekday afternoons at 3 Central on American Family Radio. Sadly, as believers, we can be pretty self-centered and selfish about our prayers, praying for I, me, mine. The Lord taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer. It says, 
our Father. Not just simply my Father, but our Father. We need to pray much daily for each other and pray with one another as well. That's so, so very important for each and every one of us. Tune in to the Hour of Intercession, weekdays at 3 a.m. Central on American Family Radio. Some guy who claims to be a girl is not science. I'm sorry. You no, did, it's not. You just can't claim to be something that you're not. No, we don't allow people to choose their ethnicity. No. Or their age. No, I can't say I'm, you know, I'm an Eskimo, so provide me with a free igloo. We yeah. don't let people do that. We don't. You're a male, and you can't claim to be a female, because you're not. Today's Issues, weekday mornings at 11 Eastern and 10 Central on American Family Radio. The Hamilton Quarter Podcast and one-minute commentaries are available at AFR.net. Back to the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner. Abraham Hamilton III here. We're in the final segment of today's program, but I want to pick right back up where I was before the break in Psalm 127. So you'll notice that in the simile that's employed, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. The Lord intentionally employs a simile because he identifies the fact that the arrow is, no pun intended, fearfully and wonderfully made. It is made with all of the potential that is required in order for the arrow to be effective in hitting the target that it was created, that it was fashioned to hit. But as wonderfully made, as wonderfully crafted as the arrow is, In order for that arrow to actually be effective, it requires trajectory and direction. The trajectory and the direction is provided by the skillful warrior. Now, I could go through through Nahum, go through Jeremiah, and show that the Scripture clearly has in vision, has in view, has in mind, the Lord has in mind. When he refers to the skillful warrior, he is talking about men. The fathers. Very similar to where we started in Ephesians 6. The skillful warrior is to provide the trajectory and the direction for the arrow. One of the things that we need to understand is that trajectory and direction provision in the Lord describing arrows that way in the relationship from between the arrows and the warrior is the Lord is literally, literally revealing that it is his will for the warrior to provide the spiritual impetus and heritage and inheritance, if you will, to bolster the arrow. I often pray, many of you have heard me say on this program, that I pray to the Lord, Lord, may my ceiling be my children's floor in you. It is not the Lord's desire for children born into Christian families to fend for themselves spiritually as of first instance. It is our Lord's desire that our lives serve as a runway, if you will, for the airplanes of their lives to take off into kingdom investment and participation, which is anchored by being born again, first and foremost, and secondarily living lives as disciples, full out in submission to the Lord and his purposes. Among the things that we fathers, Ephesians 6, 4, that we are called to as we are offering our children, instructing them in the paideia and nuthesia of the Lord is not only academic matriculation, it's not only spiritual development, but it also includes putting them on the course to be able to provide for themselves in their lives. Many times the concept of discipleship has been far too narrow in either limiting limiting it exclusively to what's commonly understood as spiritual growth Because biblically speaking, there's no such thing as spiritual growth that excludes the cultivation of the mind. Jesus himself said that we ought to worship him how? With all of our heart, souls, minds, and strength. We ought to love him with our heart, souls, minds, and strength. We should love the Lord with our minds. We should also love the Lord with our strength. That speaks to not only the the, the investment emotionally and in volitionally, but also the physicality that the Lord has blessed us with. That should also govern how we navigate our bodies and our health and things of that nature. 
But discipleship also includes putting the disciples on the trajectory to where they can generate the resources that are necessary to provide for themselves naturally. And what my wife and I have found, and I've said this before, quantity of time gives rise to quality of time. In having the quantity of time, there are things that we're able to learn of our children. For example, we get to learn their learning styles. When my wife was on the program with me, with me we talked about that. All children are smart. All of God's creation, all God's fellow image bearers are smart. We just have different types of smarts. I'm a linear learner. Give me a book, put me in the corner, I'm good. My wife is a kinesthetic learner. She needs to be physically engaged with the stimuli that she's endeavoring to learn. Of our children, we have several children that are like me. Give them a book. We have several children that are like my wife that are kinesthetic. We have other children that are a blend, a merge of the kinesthetic and the, and the literary learners. Adding in auditory. Adding in visual. But they're all smart. I'm smart by God's grace. My wife is smart by God's grace. Similar to discerning our children's learning styles by spending time with them, we also learn their communication styles. This is what uh, Dr. Gary Chapman in the Five Love Languages book hits on. And, and, and he presents this within the context of marriage for spouses to learn each other's love languages, how they communicate and receive love. But it is not limited to the marital context. Our children have love languages. In addition to learning styles, they have love languages. And I, I had a son who had a birthday recently. This brother is a gift giver and receiver. This dude loves getting gifts. I have other children. One of my daughters, all she wants to do is spend time with daddy. She just wants to crawl up in daddy's lap. No matter what I'm, I could be watching football. I could be watching, you know, I like to watch pit masters. Jeff, don't laugh so hard, man. Don't get so excited. Learning how to, I'm getting close to it. I haven't done it yet. I'm getting close to put my, my first brisket on the grill. The smoking, but that takes a long time. But I'm, I'm, I'm moving it that way. I got the brisket. And I got the grill now. Now I just got to put the two together. But my daughter, she loves it. She'll sit, she'll watch me learn 15 different ways to smoke a brisket. She'll stay there with me because it's the time, quality time for her. Not only do you learn that, but guess what other things you get to learn? You get to learn their giftings. What has God gifted them? How has God gifted them? What has he given them the inclination to do? And it is my job as my children's father to help them to learn and to understand how God has gifted them. And one of the ways that as a warrior that I give my children trajectory, trajectory and direction as I help them to merge their learning styles, their communication styles, their love languages, and their giftings to their income-generating capacities. Whether it be entrepreneurial endeavors, I, I know for, for sure I have at least one son who is clearly going to be an entrepreneur. I know that. So one of the things that I have the responsibility to do is to help my son learn how he can utilize his gift to worship the Lord first and foremost secondarily to utilize his gifts to serve people, to love and serve people. The motivating factor for his gift usage is to grow and to edify the body of Christ, not to benefit monetarily, but in the process of teaching him how to uh, utilize his gift to serve, to love the Lord, to worship the Lord, and to serve people, I also provide a bridge for him to learn how he can generate revenue through his giftedness, through their giftedness. This is a part of our jobs. For children born into Christian families, the Lord doesn't want them, the children, to figure out on their own. Well, what are they going to do? What are their majors going to be in if they go to college? The parents should be there to help with that. The children shouldn't be tasked, tasked to figure out on their own. Can I start this business? Can we monetize this? And listen, it doesn't mean that you have to have all of the knowledge in the area. You can set your course to learn with the child or or you can set your course to find the Solomon in the particular particular area 
where the child is gifted. You may have a, have a child who's gifted in writing, a gifted writer. You may not be a writer, but you can work with the child to find a gifted writer near you who's doing or is learning to do what you believe the Lord is leading your child to do. And all of this should be, should be superintended by much, 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 much prayer. One of the first things as a skillful warrior that I, that skillful warrior that I must do is I must train my offspring, the ones whom the Lord has entrusted to, to my care for a season, to be just as dependent upon him as I am. We're not going to just try to figure this out on our own. We're going to spend some time fasting and praying together. Lord, help us to understand. Show us, Lord, who you've made this child to be, what you've made this child to do. And we'll work together in discerning the direction the Lord would have us to go. Very similar to when the Apostle Paul was prohibited from going into Bithynia and those regions. The Bible records that Paul conferred with his ministerial team as they sought the Lord, and then collectively they discerned the Lord was summoning them to Macedonia. This, brothers and sisters, is a part of our discipleship investment. This is a part of it. I'm not saying this is all of it, but this is a part of it. For our sons and our daughters, how are they gifted? How has God bent them? How has God made them? How has God fashioned them? How is God wanting to utilize their giftings and abilities and talents in serving his purposes in their particular iteration of it? Through doing this, we help provide for our sons and daughters a grid through which they're even able to evaluate potential spouses. And I've used this analogy before. If I have a son who I know the Lord is called to be a full-time missionary in China, he probably won't be joined to a wife who has no <laughs> affinity whatsoever for learning Mandarin. <laughs> will we'll completely will refuse to eat Chinese food. Can't stand it. That's probably not the one for you, chief. <laughs> or vice versa. If there's one that's gifted in a particular area, but you're able to identify a complimentary gift set in a potential spouse. And you see the Lord putting them together with that complementarity for his purpose. All of this is a part of what we are to be invested in when we're making disciples specifically of the children that the Lord has entrusted to our care. The whole training, Paideia, the whole training of the mind and the morals the whole training means there's nothing left out. We're talking about academic matriculation. We're talking about financial literacy. We're talking about relational literacy. We're talking about theological development. We're talking about academic matriculation. We're talking about occupational pursuits, entrepreneurial education, communication capacities. The whole training of the mind and the morals. That is what we are commanded to do and to be. Having a minimized or truncated view and understanding of discipleship causes us to miss so much of what God has made available for us. This is also why it's so important. Let me say it this way. Additionally, this is vitally important because you begin to see how every joint in the body can supply. You know, you, you, you have that banker who's in your congregation who, who, who may not see themselves as being the most, you know, exegetically astute. They don't know Hebrew and Greek and all of that, but guess what they know? Banking. <laughs> and God has planted them in your local assembly so that your children and the children in the local assembly have an in-house expert to communicate financial literacy. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, it's in the house. But because we've had a, a, a truncated view of discipleship and we often have had a minimized view of ministry even to where the banker has not recognized that their usefulness in the body of Christ in the, in the local assembly hasn't recognized the bank, banker's usefulness in the body of Christ. All they know is why he's always, why are they so concerned about numbers? <laughs> he's going to make sure the budget is balanced, you know. Man, that's a blessing. That's a blessing. 
We need this type of understanding in the family of God, man. To where every subsequent generation of believers, as much as it has to do with us, have the privilege and opportunity for our ceilings to be their floors. And instead of uh, seeing, you know, as the, the, the phenomenon, as Dr. George, George Barner has pronounced and lamented so often to see subsequent generations of, of children born in Christian families carried off like spoils of war, of this spiritual warfare by the enemy. We'll see the opposite. Arrows who've been entrusted to warriors become fellow warriors who stand in the gate, shoulder to shoulder, to contend against the enemy. Instead of seeing a winnowing impact of Christ following in our families, in our communities, in our nation, we'll see the opposite, an expanded battalion of robust and faithful witnesses that we're able to say, yeah, we understand the times that we're living in. We understand darkness is covering the earth and gross darkness to peoples, but the glory of God has risen upon us. And we know the Lord has deposited us with such a time as this. So as much as it has to do with us, we will contend for the glory of our King for all of the time he's given us on this side of eternity. And then on the other side, we'll enjoy him and the family of God forever.